Friends, uh, I don't know how many of you know Mumbai First, but I'll just very briefly introduce Mumbai First. Uh, so on, first of all, on behalf of Mumbai First and our associates, the museum, Avid Learning, and the Kala Goda Association, I welcome you this evening for a journey of art, culture, and heritage. Mumbai First is a not for profit which has registered in 1995 and catalyzes in making Mumbai a better place to live, work, and invest. With its unique model of public private partnership, it was set up by industry's leaders 27 years ago namely the Tatas, Mahindras, Godrej, the ICIC, iBank, HDFC, are a few of the patrons of this organization, which has worked with the union state and municipal governments as a non-partisan body able to engage citizens, experts, captains of industry in making Mumbai a better place. Its vision is to facilitate for Mumbai cause the best possible environment for social, economic, and educational progress, including healthcare and mobility. It strives to make the metropolis a better place to live, work, and invest. It addresses the problems of today and the opportunities of tomorrow through partnerships with government, business, and civil society. Mumbai first fulfills its vision and mission by researching, catalyzing, advocating, and networking. Today, it is one of the most successful examples of a public-private partnership in the world. We all have heard of Azadi Ka Amrit Motsav, which is the commemoration of 75 years of independence of our nation and the glorious history of its people, culture, and achievements. This Mahasav is dedicated to the people of India who have been instrumental in bringing India thus far in its evolutionary journey. The official journey of Azadi Ka Amrit Motsav commenced on 12th March 2021, which started a 75-week countdown of our 75th anniversary of independence and will end post a year on 15th August 2023. Much like the Indian freedom struggle, the city of Mumbai has had a prominent role in the pre-independence freedom struggle, as well as in the post-independence nation building. Mumbai was the intellectual capital of the resistance during the freedom struggle and is the financial and economic capital post-independence era. Taking a cue from this, Mumbai First is curating a three-part discussion series inviting eminent speakers to recall the journey of the city of Mumbai in the past 75 years. The theme will be Mumbai at 75. That's what you read at the backdrop. And we'll look at what the city has achieved for the nation, what remains to be explored, built upon, and improved in our city. In each part of the three-part series, we want to touch upon the following themes. Economic growth, Mumbai's journey from seven islands to an economic powerhouse, the MMR. Governance, the journey of governance in a city, which one of the oldest municipal corporations Third, and that's what we're starting with today, art, culture, and heritage. The city is traced with art, heritage, films, and culture. With its illustrious history, some of the best designed architectures and celebrated forms of art, Mumbai thus proudly emerged as the city of dreams, with a vast cultural identity since independence. Mumbai depicts its connection with various traditions, heritage, music, films, and fine arts through its monumental locations 
and rich heritage. Thus, this is our first panel discussion, making of a cultural metropolis from the three-part series of Mumbai 75. Let me now introduce you to the panel, starting with Mr. Sabyasachi Mukherjee, Director General of CSMVS, that's where we are all sitting now, and also Director of the Postgraduate Diploma Program in Museology and Art Conservation at CSMVS Institute, University of Mumbai. Under his leadership, this institute has undergone extensive modernization, including refurbishment of the museum's main building and the establishment of a conservation center, a new children's museum, an institutional archive, new galleries, and educational initiatives. Uh, I could have gone and on and on, but we've just taken out very few salient features about each of our panelists. The next, ladies and gentlemen, would you like to welcome him with a round of applause? Thank you. The next gentleman is Mr. Vikas Dilavari, a practicing conservation architect with nearly three decades of experience in the field of conservation. His practice has successfully executed several conservation projects, roughly about over 50, ranging from prime landmarks to unloved buildings of Mumbai. A, to a total of 17 of his projects have won the UNESCO Asia Pacific Awards for Cultural Preservation in Southeast Asia. Ladies and gentlemen, he needs an applause, yes. He was also instrumental in intact Mumbai chapter to terminate CS Chhatrapati Shivaji Maharaj Terminus or, his, or erstwhile VT station as the World Heritage Site in 2004. Ladies and gentlemen, that's Vikas Dilavari for you. We now move to a lady. Let's cut the monotony. That is Manjiri Kamat, Dr. Manjiri Kamat. She is the professor at the Department of History, University of Mumbai. She specializes in modern Indian history, urban history, history of labor, and history of medicine. Her research interests lie in urban history and heritage and medicine, as I said, with special focus on Mumbai, the heritage of Mumbai. Her book, Bombay Before Mumbai, very interesting, explores the ambiguities, contradictions, tensions in the way Mumbai's diverse groups negotiate shared spaces. We have amongst us, yes, please welcome her. We have amongst us Mr. Asad Lalji, Senior Vice President, SR Group, a dear friend of Mumbai First, CEO of Avid Learning, a public programming platform and a curator of Royal Opera House, Mumbai. Under Asad's leadership, Avid has distinguished itself with a variety of arts and cultural programming and is currently at the forefront of India's cultural hub. In 2016, he was appointed curator of the newly restored Royal Opera House, Mumbai, for which he has designed a robust program. In 2018, Asad was inducted into the prestigious Fiki Art and Culture Committee and has co-convened convened, sorry, foray conferences for Fiki smart cities, art cities, IP in Mumbai, and Bangalore. That's, ladies and gentlemen, Assad. We now move to Rochelle. Rochelle Potker, author of The Arithmetic of Press and Other Stories, it's a fiction, and Bombay Hangovers 2021. Rochelle is the alumna of Iowa's International Writing Program 2015 and the Charles Wallace Writers Fellowship Sterling 2017. In her book, Bombay Hangovers, she has portrayed stories that compulsively narrate the routine lives of the city's residents, Mumbai, by night. She has also won the Pocketwala Sinestan Web Series Idea Contest 2021 for anthology of Bombay stories 
slice of life. I like that. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, this lady has art in her blood, art under the skin. Wherever you see, she has art written all over. And that's none other than Rael Padamsi. She's vibrant, she's versatile, she's dynamic and well-known theatre personality who's well-reputed in the field of theatre production. Design, execution of mega events. Her company, Ace Productions Private Limited, has been involved in all these activities for over 20 years. She founded Create Foundation, a public charitable trust, and we at Mumbai First have done many such charitable um, programs for children, municipal children, with Ryle. And Ryle, thank you once again for that, uh, which was in 2002 and in loving memory of her mother, Pearl Padamsi. The trust aims to devise a revolutionary system of education by using the creative arts. So ladies and gentlemen, let us welcome <laughs> Ryle. Another secret is Ryal also happens to be the school friend of my wife. So I have to behave myself this evening. Otherwise the word will spread. Now ladies and gentlemen, we have a man who's going to run today's event. A man who has always uh, uh, been very eager to work with Mumbai first and we always look out for him. Where is Naresh? And there he is. So. Naresh Fernandez, who's going to moderate and of course give his views. He is the editor of Scroll.in, a digital daily and a consulting editor at National Geographic Traveler India. He was previously editor-in-chief of Times of India, which has editions in Mumbai, Delhi and Bangalore. He, ha he has also worked at the Times of India, the Associated Press in Mumbai, and the Wall Street Journal in New York. If he wasn't there, he would be there. He is the author of the widely acclaimed and prize-winning book, Taj Mahal Foxtrot. Excellent name. The, definite, the definitive history of Mumbai's jazz age from 1930s to 1960s. Naresh is my type of a man. I like jazz too. So ladies and gentlemen, we... On behalf of us all, welcome you this evening. It's so nice that you're here with us. Please enjoy your evening. And I'll now hand over, finally, uh, to Naresh to take this further. Naresh. Good evening. Thanks so much for having me here. I need to purge the internet of some fake news, clearly. Uh, but uh, we'll get to that in a bit. Uh, I thought uh, I would sort of start this. Uh, can we have the first slide, please? by uh, taking us back to uh, um, uh, that moment uh, of the midnight of August 14, uh, 1947, uh, shot in a building around the corner from here. Uh, this bunch of dapper gentlemen uh, on the stage at uh, the Taj Mahal Hotel at Apollo Bandar awaiting India's tryst with destiny. That's the hotel's resident band uh, led by a saxophonist in the middle there, called uh, Mickey Correa. They will soon be joined by members of another immensely popular outfit, uh, led by a trumpet player who went by the name of Chick Chocolate. Um, together, they will let rip some of uh, the most popular dance hits of the time for Bombay's elite. Um, could we have the next slide, please? In that audience is uh, the industrialist J.R. D. Tata, and Vijay Lakshmi Pandit, who leads India's delegation at the United Nations. Could we have the next slide? From the program of that event and from the accounts of some of the people present, we know that it was a rather Bombay affair. Uh, that, of course, was a very elite venue, and the audience was about as upper crust as you could get. But in that room 75 years ago, uh, we get a sense of why Bombay was considered a leading uh, cultural metropolis and still is. 
Uh, it contained the seeds that sprouted into a whole variety of shrubs and trees and flowers that added culture, not, uh, that added color, not just to the lives of people in this city, but to people who lived in the distant corners of India and far beyond. So to begin with, uh, on the left, you can see uh, a very Frenchified menu reflecting the city's propensity for mixing and matching ingredients and cooking styles, uh, a propensity that still leads to the enthusiastic creation and consumption of dishes like Cheswan Idli and Cheese Vada Pao. But on the top, you'll see there's a note that reminds us that money can't, couldn't always buy you everything. Uh, there was rationing in place, uh, and the nation faced food shortages, so patrons could only order two dishes. Also on the program was a variety of items and an independent ballet, uh, as you can see, an independence ballet presented by Shireen and Khurshid Vazifdar, pioneering Parsi sisters who were prominent classical dancers of the time. Uh, in addition to performing in India and abroad, uh, Shireen Vazifdar would, in a few years, uh, a few years later, in 1954, do the choreography for uh, a Hindi film called Mayur Punk and Khurshid uh, Vajifdar would appear in that movie. We don't know if the men they were going to marry were in that audience, but I'd like to think they were. Uh, Shirin Vajifdar's husband was the writer Mulkraj Anand, who was among the early uh, Indian writers in uh, English. And Khurshid would uh, go on to marry the artist uh, Shyabak Ch Chavada, uh, could we have the next slide? And he was best remembered, this is Shirin Vajifdar. And the next slide, um, these are, uh, this is a painting by Shabak Chavada. He would be best remembered for his vibrant pictures of dancers. Uh, I think he had a little inspiration at home. Uh, but we know for certain, even if they weren't in the audience, uh, next slide please, that uh, in the audience was this brooding young man, uh, the journalist D.F. Karaka, and he left uh, a vivid account of the event. Uh, he worked for the nationalist newspaper, uh, the, uh, the Bombay Chronicle, and he writes that as it neared midnight, the lights in the Taj ballroom were dimmed, and he stepped forward to make a speech. He said, today we join the community of the free peoples of the world. The flag which was once the symbol of rebellion is now the flag of the people. Let us hope that under it, this great country of ours will find peace, dignity, and greatness again. Then the lights flooded back on, the crowd cheered, and the jazz band launched into a jaunty version of Janaganamana, which was not yet uh, the national anthem, it was still the national song. Uh, we have another account of that evening by Shahrukh Sababala, who worked for the Free Press Journal and whose brother uh, was the painter Jahangir Sababala. He writes that the street outside was a sea of dancing, singing, gulal throwing humanity. That happy throng, uh, reports say, were throwing their Gandhi caps into the air and singing Jai Hind, somewhat improbably to the melody of the old Irish music hall tune, It's a Long Way to Tipperary. <laughs> and then, in a little while, the Taj decided to throw open its doors, and the crowd flooded in. They were all served cups of tea and a snack. Um, the next slide. Karaka would go on to write pioneering English language novels and penetrating non-fiction books about post-independence India. And those jazz musicians we saw in the first slide did their fair share in helping the city develop its reputation as one of the world's leading cultural metropolises. Uh, can we have the next slide? They would go, they would play swing at the Taj and other elite venues uh, by day, uh, by night, but by day they filled into the Hindi film studios and helped create the soundtracks that millions of Indians love. Uh, this is, uh, I don't know how many of you all can recognize the people in that. That's Mohammad Rafi. Lata Mangeshkar, C. Ramchandra, and that is Chick Chocolate, whose real name was Antonio Xavier Vaz. I have, we don't know who the little boy is. So if anybody knows, tell us. 
<laughs> I'd have loved to be at Apollo Bandar on that night of August uh, the 14th, 1947, to witness for myself that fleeting moment that tells us something important about how our city came to gain its reputation for being an important cultural metropolis. I'd have loved to drink in the excitement of a nation faced with endless possibilities, uh, to be caught in the churn of cultural forms, elite and street, feeding off each other, that makes our city so in unique. I'd have been thrilled to witness, even for a brief moment, the collapse of social boundaries that's so essential to creating a vibrant cultural metropolis. But now on to our stellar panel. I'd like to begin by asking Asad Lalji to give us a sense of his work over the last few years and how he sees Mumbai's position compared to some others in the country as a cultural metropolis. Thank you, Naresh, for putting me on the spot, being the first one. That's a tough act to follow after that. Uh, but thank you uh, to Mumbai First and to Mr. Mukherjee for having us here. Uh, it's an honor and a pleasure. Uh, you know, I'm a newbie compared to all these veterans. I mean, the, the beauty of this panel is I, we had, at AVID have worked and collaborated with everyone on this panel multiple times. Um, and um, so I actually was a consumer of the arts. I wasn't a producer. Uh, I used to live in New York. And when I moved to Mumbai in 2010, I kind of fell into the arts, thanks to this lady sitting in the front, Mrs. Ruya, who had started AVID as a continuing ed program. And she asked me to join her and help. And together, we decided to change it a little and make it the cultural arm of the SR group. And um, that journey has been quite, uh, quite fulfilling, at least for me, um, because if you ask me, I didn't know what I was doing. I was just doing things that I felt was good and that I was interested in. And that made sense. Um, and what we did was uh, we primarily do talks, workshops, master classes, festivals uh, in the area of art, culture, heritage, and innovation. And through the course of these now 10 plus years, um, we've collaborated with essentially with the whole arts ecosystem uh, to create programming that Mumbai um, I think there's, a, there's sometimes a gap that Mumbai wants to see, and, and through that, working with the Kalagor Arts Association, I see Brinda there, I used to co-curate the literature section, now I'm on the committee there, and also working with other platforms like the Royal Opera House. I was very fortunate to be hired as the curator before it opened. I didn't quite realize what I was getting myself into before that, but it was, I mean, as every day I think it's an honor to be there and take a beautiful building and bring it to life. See, conservation and the work Vikas is doing, and look how beautifully he's restored the museum. And if it wasn't for what Mr. Mukherjee is doing, by bringing this building to life with the kind of programming and the events. So I aspire to do the same with the Royal Opera House and, um, and working with Apex organizations like FIKI and trying to help you know, advocacy in a way to help move the envelope a little. How much more do you want me to speak? I mean, I can go on forever. Uh, and you know, I mean, I'm, I'm in awe. Two minutes more? Wow. Uh, um, and so, you know, the thing is, I'm, I'm obsessed by Bombay. And I, I lived away for many years. I lived in New York. And I keep saying New York and Bombay have many similarities. And when I came back, I was sitting with Naresh in the bagel shop in Bandra. And we came up with this wonderful idea of starting a series called Multipolis Mumbai, which we did 50 episodes of. And the idea of looking at Bombay as a construct that supports or hampers creativity and is an engine for growth and innovation and excitement. And we did that series, and through Manjuri, we uh, launched another series called Urban Legacies, um, looking at the diasporas that have built Bombay, from the Jewish diaspora to the Portuguese to the Chinese, Iranian. Uh, last week, we did the Armenians. And now we have a whole, another whole slew coming, which I can't tell you about soon. Um, but you know, uh, another, another area which I'm particularly keen about, which is not something that you have to tick off the box, but it's something everyone has to take into consideration as part of their, their life is sustainability. And so we, at AVID, we launched a sustainability series in partnership with Mr. Mukherjee in lockdown. And speaking of a lockdown, um, you know, that changed everyone's lives. And we took advantage of it to launch our online program. And in the first year of AVID Online, we launched 200, we, we completed 240 programs in one year. Something was wrong with us, I know. But, uh, but it was a, the wonderful experience to actually use that time to kind of 
uh, you know, decode and understand areas that we were interested in. And, and our audiences, uh, besides the Mumbai audiences, our global audiences, uh, kind of really reacted it well. And we have lots of interesting things planned, which I'll come to the future gazing part, I'm sure. But thank you for putting me on the spot, Naresh. Thanks. Uh, Manjuri Kamat, I wanted to ask you about the elements that go into the making of a city's culture, especially um, with uh, relation to your work uh, on workers in Bombay and also Sholapur. Uh, thanks, Naresh. And again, uh, delighted to be here. And uh, thanks to Mumbai First and the museum, uh, along with Avid Learning, uh, for the support. Um, well, uh, what I would like to say here with, uh, in connection with uh, my work on Mumbai's history and heritage as, uh, as also labor, that uh, if we look at the history or, you know, kind of in brief, take an overview of uh, the, hi the history of Mumbai, what we find is that every stage, the heritage and the buildings have, uh, you know, grown along with the various milestones, uh, economic, social, political, uh, in the history of the city. And in that sense, uh, a major uh, thread which I see is the public-private partnership. Uh, in the city, in the sense of uh, businessmen taking interests in petitioning for a university, in the starting of the railways, and it goes on. So the building of the heritage is also part of this. The citizens were actively involved along with the British, so uh, that's what I would like to say. And coming to its history in the 19th century, its industrial past, its maritime past, one finds that uh, at every stage, uh, for example, with the coming down of the fort walls, you have a particular type of architecture coming uh, in, in the city with uh, Bartle Frere and that whole vision, uh, to the point where you see uh, a crisis like the plague. And the first experiment uh, which you see in the whole of India, where the government is taking the initiative to form a trust on the model of the Glasgow Improvement Trust in Scotland, uh, to particularly look at uh, you know working the housing for the workers, open up congested localities, and so on. So th those are innovative experiments which happen here. And later, as one goes into the 20th century, forms of architecture like Indo-Saracenic with the museum building, the gateway, and you know, the Taj, of course. And uh, later, one finds uh, the Art Deco. Uh, but what, uh, what we see here is that at each point, there is a context in which uh, you know, the heritage of, the, the, the built heritage of the city uh, has been built. And again, post-war, you find a, a particular style coming from uh, from Paris uh, to Mumbai, and that's the Art Deco. But while this is happening on one side, again, as you rightly said, on the other, there are still efforts by the government, like the BDD or the Bombay Development Department, once again, to address uh, the, the housing of the urban poor. And uh, you know, so, so I find that uh, you know, quite uh, interesting in, in the history of uh, this. And as one comes, to independence, I uh, am struck by what Professor Mariam Dosal has written in her book, that this is a time when one sees a lot of debates happening amongst the architects, and uh, of course, which are mentioned in the journal of the Indian Institute of Architects. But what she uh, sees, and I find that quite important in, the, in terms of the theme of this panel discussion, is that kind of debate and discourse, once you come to the 1950s and 60s, is on the ebb, uh, so to say. So I would, uh, you know, stop there because I think later one can go into the last 75 years. Thank you. Um, Roshal, tell us how Mumbai's long plurilingual history of writing in so many different forms, in fiction, in poetry, in autobiography, have woven its way into the fabric of the city. Take it. I your time brief very seriously, so this is exactly 4 minutes and 40 seconds. Because I'm a practicing poet, if we speak more, we are kicked out of the stage. So I'll read. I've collated all my thoughts. And uh, as early as, as 1832, visitors to Mumbai 
remarked of its heterogeneity, referring to B. Hall in the Kosambi, 1986. The historian Gyan Prakash says as early as 1930s that Bombay was the place to be if you were a writer, an artist or a radical political activist. Bombay, Mumbai has been home to writers and poets of varying backgrounds, most of whom lived here and some of whom came from other states, smaller cities, rural backgrounds and even those who left the city. Still identifying as Bombay writers and like the Marathi novelist Bharat who moved into the interiors of Maharashtra, or poet Arvind Krishna Merhotra, who lived for most of his life, or lives in, for most of his life in Ilhabad, and still calls himself a Mumbai poet. The city's poets and writers found insight in the charmless chawls, the cramped trains, the broken park benches, prostitutes, the monsoonal rains, traffic lights, bakeries at the corner of midnight, water shortages and riots, or Dasal's Gandu Bagicha or Aspaka's Park to etch out their verses. The city provided them a congenial space, even if they came from migrant and minority communities, where they refused to imitate Western ways of poetry and wrote instead on guilt, sexuality, ambition, rebellion, conflicts, shame, childhood, love affairs, and their fractured selves. The city then became as confessional as its poetry. The social theorist Michael Foucault coined the word heterotopia in the 1960s, which meant worlds within worlds. Through Bombay or Mumbai's poetry and stories, I see that the city is a world of center with multiple fragmented worlds within itself. With every new poem, every short story, every film, every play, I see another city within the city. The 1950s and 60s was a time for beat poetry, sound poetry, visual poetry, concrete jazz poetry, and surrealism. It was also a time for feverish experimentation in all art form. This period was also referred to as the Indian Renaissance. It had poets forming alternative small presses and workshops. Okay, they spearheaded journals and underground little magazines like the cyclo-styled Shabda, which was uh, by Dilip Chitri and Kolatkar in the 1954s. Or the Damn You, a magazine of the arts in 65 by Arvind Krishna Merotra. It was modeled around the American publication of Fuck You, a magazine of the arts. Then Dionysus in the 1960s and the small publishing cooperative, The Clearing House in the 70s. Places in the city created iconic movements like around the Jahangir Art Gallery, Kala Goda, where the progressive artist group formed of which Dilip Chitre said, the place reminded me more of an orphanage than an art gallery. We often lodged together in small congested spaces and lived in self-conscious literary bohemianism. While St. Xavier's College had many poets teach and study, the Rahasya Ranjan magazine office had rebellious poets, novelists and publishers who met to plot the downfall of the monoliths of the Marathi literary world that had outlived their usefulness. The bilingual writer Vilas Sarang remembers the 1960s in the city as one of the best and liveliest periods in the Marathi literary history. Similarly, the Asiatic Library, the cafes of Rampart Row, the Chabildas Hall space, the Theosophy Hall, that held Nizam Ezekiel's office. The Dalit Sahitya Sang in Varli, a clear crucible of the Dalit Panthers formed in 1972, was where intense intellectual debates took place on issues of nativism, modernism, and indigenism. They locate the writings of these times within the politics of linguistic, regional, and national identities. Whereas Marathi and bilingual poetic universes depicted wide-ranging collaborations. I remember uh, Menka Shivdasani, the poet, talking about how she played a key role in founding the poetry circle in Mumbai in 1986. The poet Adil Jasawala recalls the feelings of tremendous artistic potential gathering together in one place and the pleasurable feeling that Bombay was a place where you could all find release. 
Ever since those golden years of Indian Renaissance, the river of literature I see has been expanding with festivals, bookstores, libraries, poetry readings, open mics, ecstatic collaborations, books, novels, and a wide, to its wide expansive sea that brings to us anchorage. I too have found this city through a telescopic view, almost, an, almost looking through an observatory deck from other cities in the world, especially Bombay and Mumbai, becomes even more beautiful to me from the observatory deck of Seoul or Hong Kong or Dubai. Post-colonial, post-independence Bombay or post-modern Mumbai. Where, it has the, where I have had the honor to add to the, a little voice to this entire big river and sea with my short story collection Bombay Hangovers or even translating Marathi poetry into English in the coordinates of us or Sarva Aushatun Apan. And as this river and sea expands and merges into this estuary, I must say that I collaborated with so many, including Avid Learning, with the Arcs of the Circle, Dosti House, US Consulate, and Kitab Khana, and so many iconic places and venues that, and now Mumbai first, that opens its arms, and that is the beauty of the heterogeneity. Thank you. Four minutes, 40 seconds. Yeah. Because the library, um, what is it that makes Bombay's built heritage so unique? Uh, and how does this heritage influence both the residents and the visitors to this city? Yeah, it's unique from uh, many fronts. Uh, first, that of course it was seven islands, and of course it was reclaimed and made into this. But it's been more of people's efforts. It grew. It uh, grew organically, and then very planned structuring happened to it, uh, which is what transformed. Uh, the other good things were that a lot of the city became prosperous and the people who earned money gave it back to the city. I think that's, the, that's where the strength is and that's where what Manjari mentioned about pu people, public pri pri partnership. These are the best examples and this is what sets the city uh, you know, uh, at a very high uh, pedestal. If you see, uh, we, we, we were fortunate that a lot of uh, economic development happened in that period uh, where there, there was a, uh, you know, in the US uh, you had uh, this thing, the cotton supply stopped. So Bombay became prosperous overnight and uh, there were coincidentally many things happened, you know, the railways, uh, the, the opening of institutions, uh, getting the best architects, and then using the, uh, the craftsmen's, like the setting up of the universities, the setting up of the school of art, and uh, all these buildings which were being experimented were one of the finest buildings. A lot of these were held through competition, something which is missing nowadays. And that's the reason we get very mundane architecture. At that time, you got the best architecture because it was floated through competitions. And uh, of course, uh, as I said to you, everyone wanted to excel and gave the best, they chose the best architects, uh, uh, like Gilbert Scott, who had never visited India. He came to design two buildings here. So I think that's what set the standards, and uh, it's been a uh, so people's movement kind of a thing where people have contributed, and they've given it back to the city. Thanks. Ralph um, so we have a theatre tradition in over half a dozen languages that goes back at least a century and a half. Uh, your family has been involved in that for 80 years or something it would seem. Uh, tell us about that and how it influenced your work. Okay. Good evening everyone and thank you, thank you Naresh and thank you Mumbai First and of course uh, Dr. Sabya Sachi and all our wonderful panelists here. You know, I feel so happy that I'm here today because I feel the, my, this is like an homage to my family. You know, they started a lot of the English theater groups, movement in Bombay, as it was called. And I feel like I represent my parents, Paul Padamsi and Alec, of course, my uncle, Ibrahim Alkazi, uh, my other uncles, Derek Jeffries, Amin Sayani, and Hamid Sayani, who were all part of the cultural fabric of this, of this wonderful city for, you know, well, almost 75 years, you know what I'm saying. They started in the 1940s, 
my uncle um, Sultan, also known as Bobby Padamsi. Some of you all may have heard of them, some of them may have engaged with them. Uh, so Bobby actually started the first English theatre group. And he started it in our in ancestral home at Colson Terrace in Kolaba. And there were not really very many spaces to perform because at that time I think the British were mainly performing and I think he took objection to that. And he said, you know, we're going to start the Dramatic Society in St. Xavier's College. And from there on, you know, spurred so many, many, many different uh, drama groups that, uh, you know, in different languages that, you know, did some very, very prolific work. So just to give you a kind of idea, so originally there were, there were no spaces to perform and they performed at the terrace of Gulsum Terrace and Chotu Terrace, which were both our ancestral homes. People came to the terraces, you know, engaged in this theater. There was all kinds of wonderful things happening. Everybody took play, part in the costuming, the propping, everything. So it was a huge kind of almost cottage industry, but it gave voice to a lot of creativity at that time. And I think that was the first time that this was happening in Bombay, in the English language. Of course, then we have uh, the theater unit with Ibrahim Al-Kazi, there was uh, Rangayan with Vijaya Mehta, with playwright Vijay Tendulkar and actors, Arvind Deshpande and Sriram Lagu. There was, of course, Ipta. I'm just giving you a little overview of the last 75 years in the theater, which you will be familiar with all these wonderful names, the Prithvi Players, Adi Marsban's Theatre Group, and so many more. It was really an exciting and vibrant time. Tons of creativity, no formal support from anywhere. But they still went ahead, nonetheless. And they, uh, after they did all this performing, they moved on to lots of different theatres that did come up, which was the Bulabai Desai Auditorium, at um, Marine Drive, and there was the Bulabai Desai Center, of course, at Beach Candy, which lent itself to amazing kinds of creative expression, which I think um, Al Ghazi was very much a part of. There were the artists, the musicians, the dancers, everybody. It was just a fantastical time. Of course, there was Ravindranath Mandir, Tej Pal Auditorium, lots and lots of different theater spaces that came up. Later, of course, the Sophia Bhava Auditorium that everybody knows, Nehru Center, the NCPA, Prithvi Theatre, St. Andrews, and a whole host of them. Of course, now we have the renovated, restructured Royal Opera House. We've got smaller spaces. We've got G5A for experimental work. We've got Harkat Studios, and a whole host of theatres in different parts of the city. The point I'm trying to make here is that no longer is anything, you know, confined to space. It's all over the space. I mean, I think that is what is key in the last 75 years, that Bombay has grown in such an exponential way that we really have to have mini cultural centers all over. No longer can it just be at the NCPA or the Royal Opera House. It has to move out. I mean, there are all kinds of things happening all over from Pawai to Thane. We have an academy that we run for children and we have three centers in Thane and three centers in Pawai. And you know, and the, and the things just go on because that is where our main audience is now. And I think it's very important to be able to open up the uh, doors to everybody. So there were different scales of theater. There, were ex there was experimental work. There was proscenium arch theater, which is in the bigger spaces. There was, of course, high-end musicals, and or tamasha theater. Then mega, mega productions in many languages, being Hindi, Marathi, and Gujarati, and English. I have to say here, I don't think that we had any kind of funding, no support, no corporate support for the arts, unlike Delhi, which, you know, survives on, on uh, support from the government. So over the last 20 years, there's been great competition, great competition for theatre, I feel. You know, uh, originally, you wanted to go out in the evening, you went out and saw a play. Today, you want to go out in the evening in the last 20 years? There's so much happening. There's cinema, there's um, stand-up comedy, there are live gigs, there are restaurants, there are clubs, and now, of course, OTT. So we've got a lot of competition out there. And I feel that we really, really need to up our game and we need
need a huge amount of support. But the good news is we have over 200 English, Hindi, Marathi and Gujarati theatre groups which has been doing exemplary work. Prithvi Theatre has given rise to so many, many, many um, theatre groups. It's hosted their annual Prithvi Theatre Festival to encourage new work. And then we, in our own way as a theatre family, have started several initiatives for sustainability and impact to expand the scope of theatre in the city. So the Theatre Group Bombay, which was started by my uncle and then carried on by my parents and, of course, us. Today, I'm the president of the Theatre Group has reinitiated the Sultan Padamsi Award for playwriting, that is for original plays in English. And uh, my cousin Aisha Sayani runs that right now. And from 2014 onwards, we are happy to say that we have 400 original full length plays been written in English ready for production. So, anyone out there who's ready, willing, and able, please put your hands up and we're happy to take your lot. Then, of course, we have our theatre group, which is uh, called Thespo, that's for the youth. And Thespo works with all students below the age of 25. You have to be below the age of 25. So you are exposed to all kinds of wonderful elements of the theatre. This has been run by uh, my brother Kwasar, Kwasar Thakur Padamsi, and it's been on for the last 24 years. So it's dedicated to bring theatre, theatre festivals and competitions and its vast and varied areas of discipline to over 30,000 young adults across the country. Of course, we also have our ACE Academy, which we run, and we have taught over 150,000 children in speech and drama and a love for the arts. We've been doing this for the last 30 years. We direct and produce over 400 different kinds of plays um, every year with our children. And we also feel that we are impacting and galvanizing 15,000 children a year into the performing arts. So I feel that this is where the answer lies. You have to be able to get the youth involved. You have to be able, and because we're all over the city, we have 35 centers across the city. So we, we are talking to children, young adults, all over. And that, I feel, is what is important, to spread the message out there, talk about the arts, give them the grounding, and then they have wings to fly. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Mukherjee, Mumbai is home to one of the oldest museums in India. Uh, what role do museums play in helping a city develop a sense of itself? By looking at the past, how does it help us ground ourselves in the present? Good evening. Welcome to CSMBS, Chhatrapati Shivaji Maharaj, Bastu Shangaralai, formerly Prince of Wales Museum of Western India. Uh, Mumbai, I'm just connecting museum's history with the Mumbai's history. Uh, Mumbai is one of the cities, or maybe the city in the country, was built by the people, not by kings or emperors. All other cities, has a, you know, Delhi has a different history, Hyderabad has a different history, Kolkata was built by East India Company, but this is perhaps the city was built by the people. Similarly, the museum, uh, CSMBS, uh, on 4th August 1904, a group of eminent citizens uh, assembled at uh, Bombay branch of Royal Asiatic Society, now Asiatic Society Library, under the leadership of Sir Firoz Shah Mehta. And what was the discussion? Same. They wanted to talk about social and cultural infrastructure of the city. In that meeting, the citizens expressed their desire to have a cultural space. Now, I don't know, you know, we lack that. But in 1904, citizens, they assembled and they expressed their desire to have a separate cultural space for the city. And the desire was conveyed to the Bombay Presidency. Bombay Presidency accepted the citizens' appeal and considered a piece of land, aptly called uh, 
it because of its moon-like safe crescent uh, on condition that citizens of Bombay should be in position to construct the building and maintain it. This year, we completed 100 years. The museum completed its 100 years long journey. And the museum is maintained by the people of Bombay, not by the central government or state government. So this is a rare example. I think Dr. Manjuri Kama talked about public-private partnerships. So our museum is one of the earliest, you know, early 20th century example of public-private partnership. Now the concept of museum is changing with the changing world. Today, museums are no longer viewed as merely repositories of antiquities of art objects, but as centers of learning and also as civic space for social interaction. It is an open space for conversation. And the kind of challenges you know, we are facing in today's world, practically tradition versus disruption, freedom versus constraint, analog versus digital thinking, history versus contemporary history, pull over push, new audience for new kind of art. And museum has to evolve with the time. And we are evolving, truly, you know, we are evolving. And for your information, I don't know how much you know about us. Many of you visit us time to time. Uh, we are perhaps the museum in the country where you get to see prehistory from prehistory to modern and contemporary under the one, one roof, which is very rare in our country. And besides Indian art and culture, you also get to see other cultures, which is also very rare in our country. In most of the museums, Indian museums, when you visit, you get to see only Indian art. But here, thanks to Data Brothers, uh, they, they donated their entire collection as gift to the museum, so we get to see uh, other cultures. And now, uh, that cultural institutions, you know, cultural institutions were created in different period of time for different audiences. Then the others, then the ones they now have to serve. While in the past, mapping, collecting, and preserving cultural goods was one of major importance, today these traditional cultural institutes are required to connect with the society and represent the people they serve. So we are changing according to needs of society. And, and that reflect you know, all our activities, all our program. And the last exhibition we did, uh, Woman is as Woman Does by Nancy Atenia. So the kind of exhibition, the kind of education program, uh, public programming, museum education department they are designing, one can, one can understand how institute is evol evolving with the time. So this is something you know I wanted to share, that the history of museum is the history of Mumbai. Thank you. You know, I'm sure this has already sparked questions. Let's take some questions and then we can come back. Um, the gentleman there? To, to the panel, because uh, I was very pessimistic until uh, uh, and, and the museum chief uh, described how much it is going. I was going to say that's, that's where the culture is, unfortunately. Uh, other than uh, the, the uh, suburban uh, expansion. But uh, how are you, how, how is Mumbai first, Mumbai 75, the other, other uh, enthusiasts, uh, using the new medium of mobile, especially now that uh, from work from home and remote exposed everybody to the benefits. OTT is still for the moneyed people, right? It's not, it's not everybody's cup of tea or, or wallet. That's the question. Uh, 
No, one, one thing, you know, I wanted to point out, uh, I did, you know, uh, in different forums, uh, all cultural institutes, all important cultural institutes are concentrated within South Mumbai, fortunately or unfortunately. And suburbs are growing like anything. This is, this is a problem with our town planning, urban planning. Uh, not thinking about cultural spaces for suburbs. And what we see, the growth of number of malls, it's a mollification culture they are developing. N nobody thinking about any cultural space. And I gave, I gave an example in 1904, citizens assembled at Bombay, you know, uh, uh, Asiatic Society, Royal Asiatic Society, just to demand space for culture, cultural space. Uh, now, that mobile part, you know, what you are talking about, we did some kind of experimentation here. Uh, if you cannot come to the museum, museum can come to your doorstep. And today we have two big buses, museum on wheels. We call them museum on wheels. But our, you know, our objective is to reach out to rural people. So most of the time, our buses are traveling interior part of Maharashtra. We completed seven years, and now we feel that you know we need to cross the border. So our bus is traveling to Goa, Karnataka, Gujarat, and other states. So people can see, you know, everyone cannot come to Mumbai to see their cultural heritage, and cultural heritage belongs to everyone. Everyone has right. So we are taking them to doorstep. We started, you know, we completed seven years. Uh, good evening. My name is Pratap. I come from Navi, Mumbai. Do you consider it as a Mumbai? Because we, we don't get any program in Navi, Mumbai. I come all the way, drive down here. Okay, that's, that's for uh, this one. Uh, sir, is the museum coming in the VR? Is the latest technology which is being in, implemented everywhere in the world? Uh, are you coming on a VR headsets and we can see that one, virtual reality, this one? I think we have a separate platform. Uh, if, you, if you check our website, uh, I think you can visit entire museum. There is a walkthrough, virtual walkthrough. You don't have to come from your place, you know, you can visit the museum. We have that facility. Uh, you know, uh, talking of metropolises, uh, we have actually three different types of capitals. The one is the political capital, then the other is the business capital, and the other you may call cultural capital, or to keep it simple, maybe the film capital, because that kind of dominates most of the other cultures. Uh, now, if you look at uh, says, uh, a place like the United States... Can you go to the question, please? Yeah. yeah. Uh, the question is that... I have to give the example, otherwise the question won't make any sense. In the US, the political capital is Washington, the business capital is New York, and the film capital is Hollywood. Now, in India, everything is in one place. Okay, that's in, uh, in uh, Mumbai, uh, rather than in Delhi, it's spread over. So is it necessary that to become this kind of a capital, money is the driving factor and nothing else in India? Oh, sir. I have no money. <laughs> So there's financial capital and there's intellectual capital and creative capital. I think those two outweigh, but obviously money is needed to what you do. And Bombay is unique. You can't compare Bombay to a Delhi or to a Calcutta. You can't compare a New York to a Washington. Um, so each city is different. It has its strengths, it has its differences. Bombay melting, I mean, just as you know, we talk about London, New York being melting pots, so is Bombay. People come from all over the world with all the talent and their skills, looking for a platform where they're going to exhibit their talents, whether it's Bollywood, whether it's theater, whether it's the music industry, or, and you know, we've been talking only about English primarily, but there's so many regional languages where, and so much regional language theater. So I don't think uh, money is the limitation, it definitely helps. Because, um uh, you know, we have this great architectural heritage and yet as you uh, take, um, uh, as you travel through Mumbai today, all you see is a, is a sea of corrugated blue boards. Everything in Bombay is, seems to be in a state of reconstruction now. Uh, 
because of the coastal road, but also because of the change in the CRZ regulations. Uh, we've been quite good about uh, de uh, designating first heritage buildings and then even heritage precincts. Uh, what are the challenges Bombay faces in preserving this unique architectural heritage? Okay, so let me put it clear that yes, it's a field which uh, Bombay pioneered 30 years ago. The first heritage listing happened, but eventually in the passing of the decades, what we realize is we are losing a lot of heritage under redevelopment because of not very strong uh, legislations and things like that. Uh, what we had earlier, the intent and the purpose was much more better, but unfortunately, there was no incentives or no encouragement given to conservation. So redevelopment is only considered to be the alternative to uh, kind of the problems in the, uh, which the city has. Now this is where the opportunity lies, uh, where Mumbai can demonstrate if there is a political will, if the people come across together, because uh, we have reached our limitations, the infrastructure cannot cope up with this. So the idea is why not give repair a chance, good repairs, and that's where you know people like me, conservation architects, when we restore buildings, uh, we just find that it's easier, economical, and it's sustainable to conserve these. So I don't know why we want to pull them down. That's the first thing. The second thing is that uh, there was a, we have a Rent Control Act. Now that's the major drawback for the entire city because if you don't plow the money back to the building, it's not going to be looked after. And when it becomes deteriorated, it's that's where the builders come in and that's where everyone starts changing the kind of the dynamism which the city was very well planned. It was, it was planned and it was for the city's benefit, like the city improvement trust and so many other things. Now it is greed based and it is only addressing individuals. Uh, the other challenge is, again, as I said to you, there is hardly any incentive given whatever examples and projects which we are doing are a part of public-private partnership, whether it is Kala Goda or, uh, you know, uh, corporate CSR. But it shows that there is so much of a potential because the footfall which increases, uh, the tourism potential which it brings, if you take the museum itself, you take uh, VT station or CSMT, or you take Baudaji Lad Museum, that these are examples when they were just done. You know, the amount of footfall which has gone there and it becomes on a tourist map. Uh, we seriously require many such efforts, but the sad part is the political uh, inclination is not there. Otherwise, uh, you know, we would have been one of the, still the finest city east of Swiss. In the last few years, there's been an explosion of walking tours. Uh, I see walking tours of all sorts. There's a food walk. I recently saw an advertisement for a walk on uh, haunted Bombay. Uh, and it sometimes seems like me that actually we're chasing this uh, ghost of a disappearing city. Uh, because as people seem to be gaining a sense of local stories, the multiple local stories that make up this city is disappearing in front of our eyes. Um, what is your sense of these initiatives now, this explosion of interest in our city at a time when the city is changing so rapidly. Will this interest actually result in something concrete, a citizen's movement to preserve? So uh, what we see in the last few years, as you rightly said, is there's a spurt of interest in heritage. And uh, lots of heritage tours and all around there is, you know, as you say, food and uh, various other, uh, you know, small and big companies have been started. So if I may, I just want to address the point that conceptually one uh, has not seen much uh, work which has been done, especially by historians, uh, on the evolution of what constitutes heritage. And I was struck when, you know, uh, yesterday I was speaking to a visiting American uh, professor and he said that in the 60s and 70s, when uh, he first visited uh, Bombay, then uh, it was a time when uh, this kind of, you know, spot as you're seeing in these heritage tours and all was not there. And we're also talking in the aftermath of the Sayukta Maharashtra movement, and the, especially later in the 60s and 70s, there is a sort of unease with uh, the colonial uh, 
past and the statuary and something which uh, we you know are not uh, talking about which is why i think some historical work is needed to address it conceptually and after the heritage legislation which uh, mumbai pioneered in in india uh, and the listing and the heritage activism there has been a renewed interest in heritage and also because of some uh, you know the finest conservation architects one of which uh, is on the panel and the accolades which the city has received in terms of unesco awards but i think more recently uh, i feel that uh, there is also uh, a commercial element to uh, this and while it is okay because uh, you know why not i find that under this many of the uh, perhaps the historical authenticity uh, is perhaps not known let's say in iconic buildings such as a uh, university or many of the other buildings there is a architectural history as well as uh, you know a history to it so we don't know how much of that has been tapped because they at the most may read one or two coffee table books and then uh, you know do these uh, things so i think that needs to be looked into what i see would be a good way ahead is for the youngsters especially we have so many colleges and our university students where we teach these courses where if they are trained even if it is at the maharashtra tourism board level if that kind of collaboration is seen i think that would be uh, wonderful Can I yeah just add to that Actually, today um, someone just sent me this Instagram post, which I thought was quite quite topical to mention here. There's a a, a geo ad which says, uh, "Don't waste your time on heritage walks when you can have a curated shopping experience with geo, the geo store at Opera House." And we've all looked at it like, you know, should we say something about it? But uh, it just added to this question, so I had to share. But capitalism at its best. Rochel what um, structures would you like to see in place that would allow mumbai's writers to play a greater role in the life of the city uh, so uh, when i look at the poets and writers they usually come awake like stars during festivals during their book launches but i want uh, you know i want the city to have a permanence in terms of literature like what i saw when i went to iowa wherein you actually had a visceral visual experience of literature i mean i'm not just talking of the manholes that had proverbs engraved on them i think first we need to have the manual scavengers out of those manholes and then we can think of engraving them but uh, park benches had proverbs i'm not talking of only that i'm talking about a viscerality of literature and art it's not not only seasonal it's not only when the festivals come by it should be an everyday affair so um, you know I, because this is a capital uh, you, this is the financial capital of the country i was wondering uh, for poets and writers where are the equivalent booker prizes the nobel prizes the equivalent pulitzer prizes for across all art forms actually poetry is as poor a cousin as theater we function mostly on zero budget so where are all those plum prizes because we are such a rich city where are those where is the patronage for arts and where is uh, where is this collaboration that doesn't have to worry about money when we are such a rich city why are we always worried about money why can't our ideas run on that so i am thinking about this and yes i do have another idea but is it another round coming on stargazing <laughs> or i should say it now all right i was thinking when the gentleman spoke about uh, you spoke about we are i thought we are because you said <laughs> you said uh, north north and i was wondering we have not used uh, you know the sea the sea i was thinking of a sea breeze poetry festival you 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 cruise from that part of the coast to this part of the coast take all your roi mumbai because you want your roi but let us have a culture that includes the sea if we can't yet use it for transport at least yet let's use it for festivals in fact struga in macedonia has poets read on a river where there are around 12000 to 15000 audience also in boats or on bridges listening to the poet now just imagine if we could do that to bombay or mumbai because we have the bay with us and we have those twinkling lights with us so why don't we have a sea breeze festival 
That's an excellent idea of the flow. <laughs> so there is a, a street art festival which is going to happen at Sassoon Dock and I'm actually part of the advisory committee so I'm going to invite you to recite some poetry in the middle of Sassoon Dock in January and February of this year. So your wish is granted. If I may just uh, one sentence to say that if these heritage walks would have translated, for, just to give an example, suppose the Khutachi Wadi. Uh, Ananta Ashram is not there, but you now have a reinvented space uh, where, uh, you know, 47A. So if all this could translate into better heritage conservation of the precinct, then I think that would be great. And I think that in a way would be the way ahead. Rahal yeah. um, Padamsi, um, I know that um, organizers often complain that the red tape, about the red tape that's involved in organizing events. Uh, tell us about some of these challenges and what you'd like changed. Okay, you have two minutes to tell us <laughs> all your woes. <laughs> okay, so going forward, I think we definitely need more performance spaces. I mean, that's a given. We have very, very few the population we have. We need rehearsal spaces. We have nowhere to rehearse. You know, people are rehearsing in people's drawing rooms, on the terrace, and I mean, it's 2022. We have to ramp up our act. Of course, we need monies. That means we need grants, we need corporate sponsorships, we need to be able, and I'm saying this about all the arts, it's not only theater. Of course, every single um, you know, area of the arts needs this kind of support and patronage. We need no GST. That is for sure. 101%. It kind of deters people to come to the theater if you have to pay almost 20% over your ticket price to just come and see a play. It's ridiculous. I think the arts should be banned from all GST. We sh must have performing arts festivals. That is key. That is key. And I feel that we should really have Divide Bombay into our 227 wards and make sure that we do a lot of community theater. That is where the magic is. That is where you impact people. That is what sustainability is about. It's not only about three and four theaters in this city, you know, uh, uh, having plays for 1,000 people or 800 people. That's ridiculous. Look at the kind of numbers we're talking about. So definitely community-based theater, places to express yourself. I'm sure all of you all would want to do something like that in the theater, even if it's just a question of having theater work workshops or it's having a reading, a theatre reading, a visual enactment. You don't have to go into, you know, huge amounts of budgets to perform plays. This is where it's at, guys, and we have to have to push for it. Of course, like I said, multicultural festivals and definitely performances at the iconic landmarks. You know, um, uh, Dr. Sabisachi, we've seen such lovely music performances out here in the garden. We want to do a lot more theater. There was fantastic stuff happening at the Gateway. Who remembers all those performances that were happening? You know, music, dance, everything. It was, it was you know, it was memorable. There's so many more um, monuments and spaces in the gardens. Why can't we have theater in the park? We can have poetry in the park. Use our spaces. That's what's very important. And of course, definitely have discussions post the plays and the um, uh, enactments so that you engage with your audience. It's not like we are sitting here and performing and nobody's really enact, uh, interacting with an audience. It has to be about engagement. It has to be about impact. It has to be about sustainability. And one last point I want to say, we as an organization believe, as um, he mentioned about the CREATE Foundation, we believe in taking everybody along with us. So we work with the marginalized we work with the challenged, they all come together. We teach them, we engage with them, they are very much a part of our arts and culture um, engagement and they perform on stages like the NCPA and the Safai and wherever and the Royal Opera House. Um, but you know that's what it's all about. We can't have this exclusive life that we lead. It has to be more inclusive. And I end. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Mukherjee, when you look out of the window of your office at this excellent institution, uh, what do you think other cultural institutions need to be, uh, need to do, in order to really create a sense of a coherent, uh, coherent uh, cultural metropolis? See, one thing, uh, let me share with you. Uh, in my 16 years uh, 
professional life as head of the institute, uh, we all realized uh, there is a huge, huge cultural hunger in the city. There is no second question. And at time, you know, we feel how to feed them. That's the challenge, you know, how to feed them. Uh, it is also true, though we are celebrating 75 years of India's independence, we could not create any new cultural space. And uh, because did mention, uh, after 1861 American Civil War, uh, Bombay made fortune from cotton trade. And most of the institutes, iconic institutes, what you see, you know, they were established between 1850 to 1930, 35, 36. And the percentage wise, I was calculating almost 85%. So 85% cultural institutes, libraries, archives, what you see within the city, they were, they were built before independence. And this is something you know we need to address. And uh, some little research uh, I have done, if you permit, you know, what makes Mumbai so fascinating is the presence of people and its diverse cultures. But the unprecedented urbanization process over the past decades is now posing a major threat towards humanity and its surrounding. This is a threat to sustainability, both living and non-living. It is a fact, the livability, this, this, is the, this is the question, you know, this is the thing we don't question. Livability or quality of urban life depends on urban amenities safety, employment opportunities, social and cultural infrastructure, education, healthcare, commerce, transportation, sport, and natural heritage. And unfortunately in our country, cultural sector, you know, cultural sector is not equated with other sectors. And, and the budgetary allocation for culture, when budget you know, appears in the newspaper, two pages on different you know, sectors, Culture you not find. Because culture is not given any priority. Bombay Municipal Corporation, they don't have a separate section for culture. Did you notice that? Because they don't count. Though we have, you know, the state government, they have a culture ministry. I don't remember that any culture minister visited the museum. <laughs> or, or any initiative that inviting you know, cultural personalities or institutes, please come, we discuss and resolve some of the issues in the city. So this is the state of culture. And we are talking about you know, great cities, and this is something threatening. The Global Power City Index puts New York and London on their highest ranked cities, not because of accessible social or cultural infrastructure, but because of their openness to different kinds of social, political, and cultural ideas. Unfortunately, the Global Power City Index places Mumbai under Group C cities, generally weaker categories, especially in economy and research and development. And compared with Bangkok, Milan, and Sao Paulo. No city, according to me, you know, no city can be a great city unless we invest more in culture, ecology, and natural environment. So these are the things you know, I wanted to share. There is, there is a hunger in the city, but government has no interest. And how do we enlighten government? That is the challenge before us, so they understand. Uh, in the 21st century, we need more cultural spaces for Mumbai. For the last 30 years, 1,000 acres of the Portress land is lying fallow, unused. There, since 2014, some efforts have been made to plan something there, but I feel that the uh, current audience can you please suggest how we can use these thousand acres to create cultural spaces? There is no such debate happening now. So we, we hear of smart cities, we hear of so many other things, but we've never given the, the if, if the government really thinks, we've never introduced the cultural 
cultural zones. We have special economical zones. We have other things where the flexibility and the focus is given on this. I think it's high time where this can be experiment to see how, how much it helps and benefits because everywhere, it, as Mr. Mukherjee mentioned, culture is not on the budget. What is interesting while working on this museum itself, imagine that in 1904, a piece of land, which is the largest piece of land, which any other institutions in Fort happens, was given to the museum. If you, take this, uh, if you take the high court, if you take the PWD or any other building, this plot is the biggest plot with the maximum open space around. So, you know, they had a vision and if you really put collectively all the maidans together and if you visualize the fort walls broken, they had that much recreational space. So we need to think at that because it's 100 years what we are talking, we are not talking of short term 20 years and things like that. And I think that's something which is seriously missing. One major thing which is causing all these problems is the administrative problems of the lease. We've realized that the leases have not been renewed and now the leases will be renewed for 30 years out of which 23 years have gone. Actually the fort area has, you know, everything has moved to BKC. So it's in another five to 10 years, you'll start seeing that what was a vibrant cultural center is you know having a downslide it's not so vibrant as it would be and that's a matter of concern so this is where we need to think in a larger picture where everyone should have culture or have you know environment on top of the agenda and then think from an administrative point of view so looking at this i think we uh, I'm, I'm trying to link this to tourism as well uh, the point which uh, he has made, that uh, I think the textile strike of 1982 and the aftermath is a major turning point for the city, especially the workers' theatre and, uh, you know, the Shahir Amar Sheikh and Adna Bahu Sati and the kind of uh, theatre and literature one saw that, one saw there. So what I would, you know, really want to happen is uh, a textile museum I think is necessary because whichever city in the world, for example, you go to York, there is a Viking museum. Each city has its own history and its USP. So if you look at Mumbai, we have a maritime past and an industrial past. So while we are looking at what is happening in central Mumbai and that opportunity has been lost about what could have probably happened uh, in the holistically developing the Midlands as uh, you have said there is a, another opportunity here to use this space for the, you know as a cultural space as Rahil mentioned as well as for workers theatre or Marathi English and uh, Gujarati theatre and secondly we also lost an opportunity I think the Vikrant could have been a major uh, you know uh, a museum so if we could you know work on those lines and maybe a maritime museum or an, you know a textile museum uh, I think that would be wonderful. 7.30, so we should wrap up. Um, thank you to all our participants for these very useful insights into how Mumbai could reinforce its position as a cultural metropolis. In the end, though, as uh, Dr. Mukherjee pointed out, it would help us to remember that great cultural metropolises are places that are truly inclusive, where those on the margins are cared for, where housing and transportation is not a challenge, where open spaces are open to all. Um, if we make Mumbai a place in which all residents have a stake, we can be sure that its reputation as a cultural metropolis will be burnished, I think. So, thanks so much. Uh, thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, just a few minutes more for a vote of thanks, but before, we, before I embark on the vote of thanks, uh, what an enlightening evening we had this, this evening. I mean, let me assure the participants and the panelists, Mumbai First is a platform which will collate all that you have said, all that you have suggested, and all that you put on your wish list. And we will try and make it happen. Just for you to know, Mumbai first in the last 26 years had conceptualized many, many years ago the metro. 
the sea link, the coastal road, the security cameras, and now the Trans Harbor Link. And it's all happening now. So ladies and gentlemen, Mumbai first has the ball in his hand, but as you face, we too face certain frustrations. But the only difference is Mumbai first doesn't give up. It goes on and on and on. And let me assure the panel today that this is just the beginning of our relationship with Mumbai first. What we would like to do is have a small uh, meeting in our office, convenient to all of you, run a few suggestions that have come up, and then make a nice docket and see that the appropriate authorities, the people of power, at the corridors of power, get to know what we want. And let me assure you, we can make this happen. The only thing that why it keeps evading us is each one of us goes and approaches them individually. And that's where they keep playing hide and seek with us. So it's now time for us to come on the same platform. Let's talk as a group, as people who believe in culture, art, and heritage. And that's how we can go about it. So thank you for being here. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of Mumbai First, I express my sincere gratitude to all the esteemed panelists, Mr. Sabya Sachi Mukherjee, Mr. Vikas Dilavari, Dr. Manjuri Kamath, Mr. Rasad Laji, Ms. Rochelle Potkar, and Ms. Ryle Padamsi for sharing their thought-provoking and expert views in today's panel discussion. Must thank Mr. Naresh Fernandez for moderating this session so excellently, as always. My vote of thanks would be incomplete without mentioning our supporters, Mr. Rasad Laji, Ms. Twani Rele from the AVID Learning Team. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, for the constant support for this event, Ms. Himanshi Kampani from coordinating on behalf of the museum and Mr. Mukherjee for graciously agreeing to provide us this iconic venue. <laughs> Ms. Brinda Miller, are you here? OK. Thank you for uh, the Kalagoda Association and my team from Mumbai first. Thank you, guys. Uh, led by Revati Gokhale, she was heading this program. I would also like to express my gratitude to all those who have extended all technical help, our sound, our videographers, Hunt Network, TV Network, uh, for uh, help in making this event successful. Uh, lastly, I must, and most importantly, must thank the members of the press, especially Ms. Pavita Puri from the Indian Express, and all the participants for your presence and participation. I must recognize the presence of two individuals from Mumbai first, and one is our executive board member in Mr. Sanjay Ubali, who is present here. Thank you for being here. And the other from our governing board, none other than Ms. Nandini Dias. Thank you for being here. Uh, without you all, ladies and gentlemen, this day would not be a success. Thank you. Dhanyavad. Abhar. Shukriya. Go home safe and sound to your families. Till we meet again, God bless.